Welcome to our third topic in our series of webinars that's focused on managing during COVID-19 with short and long-term strategies. I am Michelle Jones from Commonwealth Catholic Charities. Two of our units from our agency that are doing the presentations during these webinars are Income and Asset Building, which incorporates the financial counseling, workforce development that helps with employment services, with job search, looking for a job, um, not only looking for a job, attaining a job, and then coaching you once you acquire a job. Small business development that's focused on the micro entrepreneurship and food pantry. We have um, a food pantries that are open to the public in Roanoke and in Richmond offices. Also, our counseling services staff will be presenting. Our counseling services are for adults, children, couples, and family. Today, we're going to be focusing on taking steps to move forward in a crisis, and we're going to be looking at what you need to do in order to prepare yourself for a virtual job process, renter and homeowner protections, and continuing to maintain your emotional well-being. As we know, the world has changed greatly in the past 30 days. It was very suddenly, and with that, there has been a lot of um, flexibility, a lot of adaptations that we've had to do. However, also it has given us a chance to maybe learn new things and to be able to see new ways of surviving and succeeding. And one of those has been the use of technology and what the internet and how that has impacted us. It has truly also impacted the job search and what that means. Last week, we talked about how, you, how do you prepare a resume to get through an electronic system so that it will end up in a human being's hand. And now today, we want to go to the next step of you've got your resume prepared and you're getting ready for a career fair. You may be getting ready for a job interview. Well, guess what? All of that is virtual now. It's not a new concept, but in today's time, it's really become a necessity for the way things are being done. So virtual hiring is going to probably not be just for now. It's probably going to be continuing and it's going to definitely be on the rise. So today, we're going to give tips on preparing for that virtual. Where everything's held online and it's the, ooh, what's next? And is that process really that much different than if you were coming in face to face? So let's give our attention to our employment navigators who are going to help us to answer that question and going to give us tips for how do we get prepared. Lindsay? So I'll start this off and we're going to try to really drive home a few themes throughout our presentation. And one of those is to try to, to kind of give everybody a little bit of hope. Obviously, this is different. We know that a lot of us aren't used to this virtual situation. It is different. We're not used to sitting in front of a computer all the time. So we want to let you know that everything is not going to be so different. Some of the stuff is the same. Obviously, technology is going to be the big factor here, and we want to help you overcome that. So go ahead, Michelle. All right. So we want to start off by talking about how you look online. So right now, since we're not meeting face-to-face -face like we once were, we thought this would be a great opportunity to reevaluate our personal online presence. And this includes a lot of stuff. So we get our clients that come in and they're looking for jobs. So we like to remind everybody of a few things. And one of those is to watch your social media accounts. So keep them clean, keep them classy. And basically what I mean by this is um, <clears throat> watch what you post on all of your social media, on your Facebook, your, excuse me, your Twitter, Snapchat, whatever social media you have. 
So what might be fine, in your opinion, might not be to a potential employer. I saw an article a while back where a young lady did not get a job because she had posted some pictures of her on vacation. And apparently the potential employer thought that these pictures were a bit too revealing. She thought they were fine. She was at a beach. And you know, in her mind, everything was fine. But also, if there's a doubt that you think, maybe I shouldn't talk about that. Maybe I shouldn't post it. Don't. And, um, you know, we think, okay, we have our account settings to private. A lot of times people will think that, but we can still see it. So they might not know how those settings work. Also, we want you to set up a LinkedIn account. Employers like those. It's a great resource and it's a great networking tool. So it can set you up with people that work in your field, people that work in your area as well, and people that might have gone to school to study the same thing you did. And one of the other things that we like to tell our clients and make sure they do is to set up an email if they haven't already done so. Employers, especially right now, are gonna communicate with you through your email. So make sure you have one and make sure it's appropriate and professional. Some of us, myself included, might have set up an email when we were you know, 12, 13 years old, when they first started coming out. We were like, oh, let's make them cute. They don't need to be cute. Just make them simple, make them professional and appropriate, and make sure that you can check it. Make sure you have access to it. And also, every now and then, just Google yourself. See what's out there. So if you see something and you think, hmm, I don't really, I don't really like that that's out there. See where it came from. See who posted it. See if it was something that you shared see if it was something that was shared about you. So if you can find the source, hopefully you can get it off of wherever it is. So also, um, Howard is gonna talk to us about how the virtual recruiting is working right now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. In talking about the virtual recruiter, we would want you to understand that it's a new opportunity to learn uh, technology and get comfortable on the internet and using your desktop or your laptop or knowing your virtual item like a cell phone. We're going to talk about the online job postings and vacancies. Back in the olden days, the vacancy ads used to be in the classified ads and they were listed alphabetically by the company. Sometimes they would or would not post a salary. In the virtual world, our new normal is going to be a need for you to um, understand that job postings are posted on career builders and indeed.com and even on zip recruiter and there is a system that the employers and recruiters will be using in looking for the right candidate for the right job and we're going to be using keywords to help filter your resume application package to that recruiter and that would eliminate the time that it takes to fill the vacant position for the employer through the recruiter that we are in partnership with. Now, our partner agencies include temp to perm companies, some direct hire, some construction sites, some janitorial, and even some administrative and warehouse manufacturing positions. And they rely on us to send them job ready, work ready adults that really are ready to go to work and start their new beginning in a career. Now, Liz is going to tell us about the employment navigator and the remote settings. So as we work remotely, we're going to continue to offer those same services that we would offer from the office. Just going to go about it a little differently, obviously. Um, we're going to continue to monitor those job postings whether it's through the normal vacancies that we look through, <clears throat> look at on our websites. We also still try to talk to our employers through our networks. One really important thing that we're going to try to do is to help our job seekers maintain their up-to-date resumes and make sure that everything's current. It's a little harder to keep up with some of our clients right now, but we want to make sure that we're up-to-date and that they're up-to-date on everything. Because, you know, we, we still want them to get those jobs. 
And we can't do that if everything's not as current as it possibly can be. And we also wanna make sure that they either have the ability to forward their applications remotely. And if they don't, we wanna help them do that. So if they don't have that ability, we will be glad to send the information for them. And you know, we don't mind to be that go-between. Some people, you know, they're operating off of a cell phone and some of those phones are old. So it's a little easier for us to do it and you know, do, the, do the virtual legwork, so to speak. And we definitely want to help them with this virtual interview process. We're all learning this together and some of our clients don't have these virtual capabilities. And some of them don't really know what they do have. So we wanna help them figure out how they can do this on a cell phone, how they can do this on a regular telephone, and how we can fit, <clears throat> help them fit in that role. So Howard's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Lindsay. Now, let's say you have a virtual interview. Now what? Well, let's make sure that your technology works, your virtual capabilities. You may have an iPad or a Google Notebook or an iPhone or Android phone, desktop or laptop. But we need to make sure that all of those items, whichever one that you will be using, make sure that it works properly. And the next thing we want to do is to work with you in practice to prepare you to speak with virtually or even on the cell phone to speak with the recruiter about who you are, what skills you have, what your passion is, what your abilities are, and how you meet that particular need. I ask individuals to consider six Ps, prior preparation plus persistent participation with equal a perfect performance. And you want to knock that interview out of the park and seal the deal on the first time around. After we look at getting you ready for the interview, now comes the practical interview where we would be willing to help you and assist you facilitating that. Sometimes we may have to go and um, do a three-way phone call, but let's make sure that your cell phone works, okay? Make sure that you have a good, clear connection, that they understand your words and what you're speaking clearly into the phone. Let's also look for something called the big follow-up to make sure that you get the name of the interviewer, the address, the physical address, or even the email address. You could then follow up and, uh, well, let's not make a phone call, but let's write them a personal thank you note. And in these days with technology bombarding us, sometimes folks would just like to get a handwritten note from the interviewer and thanking them for their time and their interest in the position. Now, this is going to take us to the next stage. We wanted to really provide you guys with some tips to help you knock these virtual interviews out of the park. As we said, there are some things that aren't extremely different, but there are some things that are very different and take some getting used to. But one thing that is super, super important is your location. And your location needs to be quiet. It needs to be well lit. You need to kind of have a neutral space. Now, sometimes we can't do that. Um, our houses are our houses, or wherever we're going to be is where we are. Um, sometimes we'll have virtual backgrounds at our disposal, so we can kind of play with that and get something that we like. But make sure to the best of our abilities that we are as distraction and disruption free as we can be. No, no kids, no pets, no husbands, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. Try to keep everybody else out of where you are for just a little bit. One other thing that's really important in a virtual setting is these ways are these ways to kind of make yourself seem a little less robotic. We hear a lot that our personalities tend to get lost in a virtual setting. So really pay attention to your body language. Make eye contact and watch your posture. Now the eye contact thing has been a little difficult for me because in a Zoom platform like we're using right now, 
everybody pops up on the right side of the screen. That's where the thumbnail view is for me. So that's where I want to look because you know, your, your instinct is to look. That's how you know, we've been brought up. So look at the camera, whether it's on your laptop, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, whatever you're using. So get it out beforehand, figure out where your camera is. If you're using your phone, figure out where you're gonna hold it, where you're gonna place it. And look at that camera, really practice. The third one also may be the most important thing we can tell you. Make sure everything works because if it can go wrong, it will. Your mic won't work, your camera won't work, your internet connection will be bad. That's happened to me, I had to go with my ethernet instead of just using Wi-Fi. So make sure it works. Do several test runs. So the fourth one kind of falls under all of this. Be prepared. Practice, be prepared, rehearse, do all that. And dress appropriately. These are the same things that we would tell you if you were doing a face-to-face -face interview. And I like to kind of talk a little bit more about this because I had a friend who just had a virtual interview and they told him to dress appropriately from the waist up. Well, you never know if you're gonna have to get up to go get some extra paperwork or if you live in a building with other people, if your fire alarm goes off. So you've got a nice suit jacket and a tie and everything and you get up and you've got basketball shorts and flip flops on. Now that's fine if you work at that company and they expect that, but that might not be the best idea for an interview. So just go ahead and make sure that you look good just in case you have to get up. You never know. And be yourself. This is once again the same as it would be in person. Let yourself and your personality shine through. They're not in the room with you. So they're not gonna see as much of your mannerisms and your, you know, your facial expressions. So make sure that they can get a little bit of how you actually are. Ask lots of questions. If you've got a question, ask them. If it's you know, about day-to-day -day operations, things like that, ask. <clears throat> it shows that you're engaged, that you actually wanna be there, that you put thought into that interview. And make sure you follow up. Obtain some contact information because you can't follow up if you don't. And send a thank you note, send a thank you email. You know, send a letter if you want. Especially right now, getting a little bit of a personal touch will make a big difference to somebody. So <clears throat> we also wanted to do a little bit more of a you know, kind of compare and contrast and tell you what's the big deal about these. And Howard's going to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Lindsay. The job seeker, you, my friend, may be asking, what's the big deal? What's different? What's the same? Why must I do this? Well. The big deal is what's different in that um, technology is constantly changing. And with that change, if you had purchased an Android phone six months ago, it's possible that you may have a need for two or three updates or more. Your location matters. In my hometown, I happen to live in a fly zone near the air base. And those jets are beautiful sound of freedom get me still, they don't interrupt my signal, and my location will be interrupted as well. Let's look at how you, in your use of technology, with your current location, can be the one that makes a difference. And what's the same? You're the same. You're the job seeker. You're the person that's going to be confident and competent enough to go in, see this interviewer, seal the deal, and get your new job. Your qualifications matter. What skills do you have? What do you bring to the table that the employer can use? How do you fit in on that team? Your preparedness, your preparedness. My six Ps stick out again. How do what you have or what you bring to the table meet the employer's needs? Okay, let's do a self-assessment, self-inventory, and the pros and cons. What do I bring to the table? What makes me stand out, different from every other job seeking us in the lobby? And as Lindsay just said, we cannot put emphasis enough that you 
should dress. How should you dress? Well, then it suggested that you dress completely a shirt, a button down shirt, and a vest slacks. Ladies, dress appropriately for the ladies' taste. And another important thing, please, 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 follow up, follow up, and follow up again, because we can send an email, and they'll get it instantly. We could trust U.S. Postal Services and send a letter or a, bit, or, or a thank you card to them. And as Lindsay stated, we can't say it enough that that personal touch in this day and technology can help you stand out. Now, Nadine is going to um, tell us about her experience in a recent virtual interview. Hello, everyone. I just want to reiterate, Lindsay and Howard, you guys have just provided some great information. And since I recently have participated in a virtual job fair, just want to reiterate some of the things that you guys have already said. So what you definitely want to do is to download the appropriate application on any device you're using, whether it be your phone or your laptop, at least the day before. If, you're having, if you have any kinks that you need to work out, it'll be a great time to get someone to help you out to make sure things go smoothly. It's important that you arrive and be ready and available on time. So if you're trying to log on for the first time to you know, a website or app, and you're not sure it's working and things start going awire, you know, it's not a good look. So you definitely want to be prepared. Also, know the device that you're utilizing. So if it's a time for you to talk, you want to promptly unmute your phone. And when it's time for you to sit back, you want to be able to mute your phone back. You don't want to fumble with that, especially if it's the point when the employer, there are multiple applicants on and employers are trying to smoothly um, associate with all the other applicants. In addition, um, you must ensure that you are giving the employers your undivided attention. You want to focus, you want to look at the computer, as Lindsay said, and you definitely want to be focused. You don't want any interruptions for your household. You don't want the kids coming over there, looking into the screen, waving hi, even though they may be cute, you know, that, that's not appropriate at that time. And also relax. It's, it's, it's very similar to a face-to-face. -face. It's just that you're on the computer, you're on your cell phone or your iPad, whatever device you're utilizing. You know, this is your advantage. You're in the comfort of your home. So relax, you know, take advantage of that. Shine while maintaining your professionalism. And I just want to wish anybody who is on this call right now to, you know, much success in your job search. You can knock it out the park. Well, Great, Nadia, thank you for those uh, wonderful tips and to all of our um, presenters, thank you for helping us to see um, how to get prepared, what to expect when we get there. There are some questions. Nadia, one is, it, you say that you've uh, been to, um, to, you participated very recently in job fairs. Were there differences as far as with did people get interviewed on the spot or how did that work? One was more of an informational session and what the employer did was they did schedule um, interviews later. And the other one was in increments where the employer was um, speaking to applicants directly. So yeah, they went either way. It can go either way. So that's why it's important for you to get on and be prepared for whichever direction the, the, um, the, the interview can go, because you may potentially have the, the option of interviewing immediately, which will be great. Right. Now, do, um, I heard with all of the employment navigators, you talked about that piece of timeliness and, and being prompt. And we know that a lot of times now by being at home, we may kind of lose track of time, are there any tips about, um, for a virtual event, how do you kind of help keep yourself uh, um, timely and making sure that you arrive on time? Because sometimes in the actual face-to-face -face one, you're like, okay, it starts at three. Well, I know I can walk in and I'll just, you know, it starts from three to five. I may get there around 3.15. But I'm hearing you say, it was very important that when it said that it started at three, you needed to be there at three online. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if that requires you to 
uh, set your alarm, um, you know, get up an hour earlier, just as if you would when you're driving somewhere and you want to leave the house at least an hour or so because you're not familiar with the area. You definitely want to get up early and prepare. That's why it's important to prepare to, you know, have your apps, everything already set, loaded. Like you should be waiting for the employer to log on and not the other way around. So it's definitely important. Like we can't use the excuse that, oh, I got caught up in traffic. Like, um, all you had to do was go downstairs. Like, so, you know, you definitely don't want to have any, any excuses. Set right. your alarms, be prepared, get ready and knock it out the park. Well, thank you all. I can definitely say, I think, Howard, with your P's and, and that we've got to remember uh, those and the preparation, preparation seems to be so important and that we really don't lose that human connection with this uh, virtual, that a lot of things are really the same. There are just a few things that maybe have changed, but we've still got to be prepared and understand that there are very meaningful ways that employers have found to engage with people besides the traditional way of the face-to-face -face, and that we can do the virtual handshakes and still get a job and do, and the hiring continues on. So, you know, love them or hate them, they're not going anywhere. And so we've got to be prepared and our employment navigators, they are there to help. And all you need to do is to call them. We actually do have listings of virtual job fairs that are happening and of employers that are still hiring and that are looking for individuals. So we can help you to uh, prepare for your job search. We can connect you with jobs. So just give us a call at any of the locations that, uh, that appear here and we'll be more than happy to help. In addition to navigating with the uh, job search, we also want to talk about the piece of navigating with your finances and looking at what does that mean in this unprecedented times. And our HUD certified housing counselor, Gary, who is located in Norton, he will actually give us some resources and some tips on some immediate things that we need to do in order to protect our shelter as a renter and a homeowner. Gary? Good afternoon, everybody. And Michelle, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, Howard, Lindsay, and Nadia, thank you so much for that information that you was able to give us about job searches. And just, I think the biggest takeaway that I had from that is just to be prepared. And much like what we're gonna talk about here, with some of the protections that are available for renters and homeowners, it's for us to be prepared to protect our housing. And that's the most important thing that we have uh, during this crisis that we're going on right now. So if we could go on to the next slide, um, talk a little bit about the CARES Act of 2020. It was what was signed into law on the 27th of March, uh, provided safeguards for small businesses and also um, consumers as well. In, the, in regards of un expanded unemployment benefits, uh, also some uh, uh, protections as far as student loan interest rates have been reduced to zero for a certain time period. Uh, also, the, the thing that I wanted to hit on the most today was the protections for renters and homeowners with mortgages. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go forward. Until May the 18th uh, of 2020, Courts in the Commonwealth of Virginia will not hear eviction cases. So during this time that people are struggling to battle a disease, they're not gonna have to worry about being kicked out of their housing. So that's really important uh, as we go forward, just to keep that in mind that there are no evictions happening right now. Also part of the CARES Act, uh, the Federal Act, was a suspension of late fees and evictions for certain rental properties through July the 25th of 2020. So again, those evictions have been suspended for the time being, and then uh, not only on a federal level, but on the Commonwealth of Virginia level as well. Keep it in mind, it is important, uh, or it is illegal for a landlord to evict someone without a court order and a sheriff's notice. Until both of those things have happened, then a landlord cannot evict a tenant. So if a landlord decides that they want to evict someone just on the spur of the moment, they can't do that, all right? Especially now with everything that's in place to protect renters. 
If a landlord tries to evict someone by disconnecting utilities or changing locks, uh, the renter can file a petition of relief from unlawful exclusion with the courts and possibly obtain a video hearing during this pandemic. So with no in-person court hearings going on right now, they may be able to get a video hearing to potentially help them stay in their home uh, during this time. Evictions that, will, that were scheduled for back in March uh, have been postponed until after April the 26th. I know we're here today on April the 30th, so any of those March evictions may be taking place right now. But again, if you have any questions about that, just contact your local, uh, local court. And also too, important, landlords have to take tenants to court in order to evict them. Again, there can't be just any spur of the moment, you know, on a whim evictions that landlords can do, right? Land, during this time, landlords are still obligated to pro uh, provide repairs to rental properties uh, to maintain habitable and comfortable conditions. So if you are renting and you have problems with your property at this time, be sure to contact your landlord because he or she is still obligated to, to fix that stuff for you. If you do have to have uh, your landlord or a maintenance person visit your property, uh, they are still required to give 24-hour notice of that. Uh, and also, too, it's strongly advised that they follow social distancing guidelines and also utilize personal protective equipment when that's possible. So, again, if you do have problems, you are encouraged to report that to your, uh, to your landlord. All right? Landlords and tenants... Um, that, that had leases in place that were set to expire before June 10 of 2020, uh, they have the option to ex, uh, extend those in, in a virtual manner right now. There's an option right now for a month to month agreement between a landlord and a tenant. Uh, so if you have a question about that and you are a renter, be sure to take that up with your landlord. Uh, if a tenant remains in the property after the lease expires without the landlord's permission, then the landlord must follow normal eviction procedures. So again, this is just like it would be if we were not in the midst of a, of a pandemic, is that if you stay in a rental property past the terms of your lease, then the landlord would still have to follow uh, traditional eviction procedures to, to evict you. Also too, should the landlord, uh, if you, you don't care, go back, Michelle, I'm sorry. Uh, if the landlord accepts payments towards rent, then the tenant may have a right to stay in that home even if the landlord has not given the tenant permission. So if you pay rent after your lease has expired and after uh, before your uh, landlord says you could stay, then you still may have rights to that home. Also yesterday when we, when we were meeting, we got some new information that there are uh, an increase in sexual harassment claims when it comes to uh, rental property and tenant landlord relationships. If you feel like you've been the victim of one of these cases, be sure you report that immediately. And there's a toll-free telephone number uh, that I'll give to you. It's 844-380-6178, all right? If you feel like you've been the victim of sexual harassment in regards to a landlord and tenant relationship, be sure you report that because during, during this time right now where, you know, People don't know what's going on from, from one day to the next as far as the, the conditions are. The law stays the same is that if you've been discriminated against, if you feel like you've been harassed in this way, report it, okay? Because there's safeguards in place for you as, as renters to protect you from this, all right? Next up. All right, so part of the CARES Act dealt with renters and also part of it dealt with mortgage holders. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit now. Um, depending on the type of mortgage that you have, uh, you, your lender may not be able to foreclose on a defaulted mortgage during this crisis. So again, if you were having problems with your mortgage before this began, it's important that you have reach out to your mortgage holder to try to apply for assistance and see what you will qualify for as well. Uh, most mortgages will qualify under this moratorium uh, and this applies to both foreclosures by auction and judicial foreclosure, which is a trial foreclosure. Um, with those uh, auction foreclosures, basically the lender can sell the home uh, without going through the court system. Federally backed loans that cover a homeowner's property and renters who live in property secure with such a loan qualify 
uh, for these foreclosure protect protections. And then what are federally backed loans? It's loans made through Housing and Urban Development, the Veterans Administration, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and then also Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. So those are the federally backed loans. Also, there may be some protections from private banks as well, whether it be BB&T, Wells Fargo, uh, a local bank that you deal with. Be sure if you're having problems with your mortgage, you contact your lender, okay? Most important thing you can remember, just make contact. Your main source of rights as, your home, uh, as a homeowner is in your deed of trust, all right? So that's kind of the, the, the go-to document that's gonna cover your obligations as the homeowner and then your lender's obligations uh, to you as well. Uh, the lender has to comply by the terms that's in that deed of trust regarding foreclosure activity. One of the things that's in there is the, the lender has to give you a 14 day notice of the date, place and time of a foreclosure sale and has to advertise that sale in a local newspaper. So again, you can have problems with your mortgage but you can avoid foreclosure just by simply contacting the, the lender, okay? Make sure you contact them if you're running into problems uh, with that. Again, I've said it once and I'll, I'll continue to say it again. If you have problems with your payments, please contact your servicer. That's the main thing we're talking about today is protecting your housing, protecting your residents, whatever, you know, whether you're renting or you own your home. The, this pandemic does not exempt you from paying your mortgage payments, all right? So if you are behind, make contact, make some plans to try to get back ahead. Uh, if you are in foreclosure right now and you filed an application for assistance and it's more than 37 days before the scheduled sale date, that servicer has to make a decision on your application for assistance before foreclosing on the property. All right, so again, you have protections to save you from foreclosure, but you have to act and you have to act fast sometimes. You have to keep a detailed record of all contact with your servicer, all right? Make notes of what time and day you called or what time and day they called you, who you spoke with, kind of the details of the conversation because the more de detailed information you have, the more you're protecting yourself if something were to come up later on. Finally, a forbearance does not equal a forgiveness of payments, all right? Basically with the forbearance in a mortgage, the mortgage company is putting the payments that would be due now at the back of the loan. So you will still have to pay those eventually, you just won't have to pay them right now. So again, you will have to make those payments up in the future. Next. Again, we said it in the last slide, keep all written documentation that you get from your uh, mortgage company. When you get these monthly statements, make sure you look at those that, you know, pay attention to the interest that's, that's accrued or also, uh, any late charges that might be on there as well. If you are set up on an auto pay for your mortgage, contact the bank uh, that you have your checking account or savings account through uh, and have that stopped. Also let your mortgage company know that you're stopping that auto payment because of you know the financial situation. Also important, monitor your credit, all right? Right now, annualcreditreport.com is giving weekly access to all three credit bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Uh, you can get your credit through them one time per week, and I strongly encourage you to keep an eye on that through, through this time. Once you get back to work and your income resumes as it was, uh, contact your servicer and get current on your payments. Make sure if you are behind uh, that you get caught up and you have a plan in place to get, uh, you know, get current on the mortgage, all right? Because again, it's about safeguarding that home. If you don't think that you're gonna be able to resume your mortgage payments at the end of the forbearance period, make sure you contact the lender as there may be additional options available to you. Also, we see it all the time during uh, times of crisis, people are trying to make a quick dollar, so there's scams going right now. Be wary of people who may charge a high upfront fee for their services. Uh, if somebody's saying that they can guarantee you a loan modification, then that's also a sign of a scam. Also, if somebody is asking you to sign your property over to them, that's another sign of a scam. Don't sign forms you do not understand. If someone sends you something that you don't understand, do not sign it, okay? Because you could be signing your property away and not understanding what you're doing. 
Also, scammers will tell you to make payments, someone, make payments to someone other than your servicer. Make payments to them, and they'll pay the mortgage for you. Nine times out of ten, that never happens. That's money that's just gone that someone has, has basically stolen. Uh, scammers will tell you to stop making payments altogether. Again, that's not a good idea. If you have questions or concerns about your mortgage, the first place you need to contact is who holds that mortgage, you know, not some third-party agency that's trying to help you. And also, they, they'll promise to make payments for you uh, if you give them your uh, bank card information, uh, checking account information. Again, don't do that. That's just a, a certain sign of a scam uh, that somebody's trying to rip you off, all right? All right, right now, there are some moratoriums on utility disconnections. Uh, many states have suspended public utility disconnections during this virus outbreak. If you have questions about uh, utility disconnections and, and that, contact the, uh, the uh, public utility that, that you have that service with, um, and they may be able to advise you what they can do. I know Old Dominion has uh, uh, temporary suspended disconnections, as well as Dominion Energy and some of the local uh, providers as well. Also to lifeline terminations, which help some of the lower, lower income, more vulnerable populations, those have been suspended through the end of May as well. All right. If you need help, uh, again, make sure you make contact with people. Uh, there are agencies around legal aid, the numbers listed there. Uh, reach out to your local Commonwealth Catholic Charities Office. Uh, speak with one of our housing counselors. That contact information will be probably on this next slide. And uh, just reach out because that's what we're here for is to help you stay in your home, uh, whether it's rental or homeowner, and to, to try to keep that part of life secure right now because we really don't know where this is going to end up. But if we take steps to safeguard our biggest asset, which is our home, then we're going to be better off for it. And I think we're going to come out of this whole period uh, better people having lived through it and gone through it as we have. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Gary, for that very informative information. And our staff will hear, as you see, there are lots of resources that are out there that have been made available in response to this pandemic. However, what I heard from you, it's communication, 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 that you've got to communicate with your creditors. You've got to communicate with your utility companies. You need to communicate with individuals. Our staff, we are here to help you. We are located throughout Virginia. And as you see, Gary was telling us uh, things because depending on where you are in the state, your um, utility connections are actually could be held by someone not in Virginia. So as we know in Virginia, our disconnections have been suspended through June 10th. However, that may be different for individuals that have uh, a utility company that is actually the headquarters is in a different state. So as Gary was saying, you do need to check. Our financial counselors, we are here to help you to establish a communication plan. We can help you understand what your fair housing rights are and help you create strategies for developing a, for your financial management in a crisis and beyond. Now, we've talked about a lot of things in a short amount of time today. And you may be feeling a little overwhelmed going, oh, where do I, you know, what all this information, how do I get the things that they said? And we're here, we're gonna have a resource link that you can get the information that you will even have how you can contact us. But that feeling may also be showing what you're feeling just in every day now. A lot of things are coming to you at one time. You're having to figure out how to sort things out, what's priority, what's not, and how do you find that space even to think sometimes. But it is important to be able to find that space and to figure out how do you manage during these challenging times with your emotions. Betsy Hudson, who is a licensed counselor in our counseling services unit, she is going to help us with continuing to give tips on how to maintain our emotional well-being. So Betsy, I'm going to now allow you to share your screen. How are you doing? 
I'm good, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Get us all set up. Okay. Um, so for those of you that I have not met yet, my name is Betsy Hudson and I'm a therapist in the counseling department at CCC. Um, those were such wonderful tips that everyone shared as I was listening um, and seeing myself in the camera. I want to add one tip, which is don't wear a turtleneck that's the same color as your couch because you will look like a floating talking head. <laughs> um, but that was all wonderful. So thanks so much. So um, we are going to do a quick review of what we talked about last week. So last week we talked about the body's stress response and how we go into a fight or flight survival mode when we are feeling intense anger, fear, <coughs> excuse me, or anxiety. And so when we go into survival mode, our thinking brain, the part that is responsible for logic and reason, um, helps us with relationships and learning, goes offline. And so deep breathing is something we practiced last week. It can be an extremely effective tool to help trigger the relaxation in our body um, and help keep our thinking brain stay off, to stay online. And so that can be a helpful tool in every area of your life, especially um, with a job interview. Okay. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, last week, we practice square breathing, which is um, where you inhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds. And so that can be a very, very helpful um, tool and is fairly easy to remember as well. So what I want us to talk about today is first off, acknowledge the extremely varied experiences that we all are having. And so there are many different realities that we're living in and everybody um, is going through different things. So some people are experiencing a lot of loneliness during this time. Some people are loving their alone time and loving this time to reset, hit the reset button, um, uh, do things that they didn't used to not have time for. Some people are loving this quality time with their family. Um, some are going stir crazy and craving alone time just, and just want one moment by themselves. Some people are surrounded by people and still lonely. Um, our family situations are all different. Some of us live alone. Some of us have little children. Some have adult children who are at the home. Some of us are struggling to co-parent or caring for older adult, adults. Where we are in our romantic relationships looks different as well. So in times like these that are so uncertain, um, there is this kind of sense in the air and this reminder that life is short. And so we are seeing um, a bunch of engagements pop up on our social media feeds. Some couples are deciding that they are not the right fit. Some people may have broken up right before quarantine or filed for divorce and now are struggling to live in the same home together. Work-wise, some people have lost their jobs. Some are finding that they're busier than ever. Um, some are finding that their job search now seems to be even harder than it was before. But with all those differences, we do have one shared reality, which is that we are all going through this prolonged period of acute stress and uncertainty. Usually when there's some sort of uncertainty in our life, there is a cap to it, right? There's, some, there's going to be an end to it. We know at this date, we're going to find out what we need to know, but there doesn't seem to be any cap to this uncertainty that we're all feeling right now. And that can leave a lot of us feeling very unsettled. And this is something we are sharing um, on a global level right now. So coping with a full house. Um, the first bullet point I put on here after talking to my aunt who has young children and adult children at home and was talking about how some days you may be in a good mood and your child or partner may be in a bad mood and how those moods fluctuate all the time, right? So we have emotions that come and go. Um, nothing is permanent, but we might not always be on the same page. And so allowing that space for each other 
Um, you know, if you have a family member who's in a bad mood and letting them kind of have that um, space to themselves for the day. I want to talk about the difference between introverts and extroverts because those differences are really being highlighted right now when we are all cooped up at home during quarantine. So there's this idea that introverts are very shy um, and extroverts are very outgoing, which can sometimes be true, but it really is where you get your energy. And so introverts, the analogy uh, is wake up with a bucket in the morning that is full and with each social interaction, their bucket gets emptier. And so introverts really need alone time to recharge, to process. Um, that is something that's really important to, for them or they may start to get um, impatient or cranky or unhappy. Extroverts are also having a tough time with this quarantine as well because they get their energy from being around people. And so there are so many things in our social life that have been taken from us and that can be very hard, particularly for extroverts. So something to keep in mind is acknowledging those differences and understanding that everyone copes in different ways. Okay, so on that same um, token with accepting and appreciating differences, again, everyone copes in different ways. So one really common dynamic we're seeing, especially with um, parents or couples, is that one person, when um, these sort of disruptions happen, one tends to want to hold on to structure, while the other might say, well, everything's up in the air, we need to cut uh, some slack, we need to be more relaxed. These are not normal times, right? And we can have a tendency to want to vilify the other person or demonize them and say their way is wrong, but there is something positive about both of those things, right? So learning to appreciate those differences and say things like, well, I need her to help me relax or I need him to help us keep structure. Um, those roles can really be complementary if you look at them that way. Communicating needs, having a code word when you need some space, when you're unable to engage, when you're just feeling like this is a little too much. Meeting kids where they are. So it can be really tempting to want to make your kids do the things that you think are what they need or um, that you would like to do yourself. But especially when I, we think about middle schoolers, teenagers, that can be really tough. And so meeting them where they are. Do they like to play basketball? Are they really into TikTok videos right now? Should we sacrifice our dignity and do make a dance with them on TikTok, okay? You always have the um, choice of telling them not to post it. Uh, so meeting them where they are. If you're making people miserable, the lesson is pivot. So this one I took from the actress Kristen Bell who was on a podcast I listened to recently. And if you have little kids at home, you will know who that is because they may be obsessed with Frozen, like some children I know. Um, but she talked about how at the beginning of this quarantine, she was going to make this big, beautiful schedule and have all these learning activities for the kids. And partway, um, a few weeks later, she realized they were hating life. And so she called them into the kitchen and said, handed them the schedule and said, I'm going to ask you to do something very important, which is rip this up. And they looked at her like she had three heads, right? Is she tricking us? And she, um, so the lesson she took from that was pivot when you're making people miserable, right? Don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it. So this activity I want to show with you all, it's called We Were Never Strangers. And it's a great card activity if you are needing to build connection with someone. It can be done through, um, it can be done virtually through Zoom like we are talking right now. Um, and it has a lot of really great prompts to help build that connection, right? So what do you think has been my go-to snack during this time? Another one I love on here, but I would hate if I pulled it or I lost this contest. Staring contest, first a smile must reveal what their kitchen looks like in this current moment. So this is a really cute activity. Um, we won't go through more of it in the interest of time, but um, it will be available for you if you would like to, to use that, okay? 
mental health activities to do with your children. This is also something we will make available to you. One that I like a lot that I would point out on here, and this is something that we um, recommend with families that we work with therapeutically, is to have a set aside time where children can express their worries to you. Maybe they can draw them or write them. And it really helps kids sort of um, contain their anxiety and have a moment throughout their day they know they can look forward to where they can open up about it. And then once it's over, they can go back to um, whatever it is they normally do with a little less weight on their shoulders. So grief during a pandemic. Um, you know, grief is a word we all know. Um, the definition, the acute pain that accompanies loss. It's usually a word we associate with death, but there are a lot of different losses that we can um, experience in life. And we are feeling a lot of grief right now, even though a lot of us may not realize um, that is what we're feeling, okay? So um, the world around us has changed. There's been a loss of normalcy a fear of an economic toll, the loss of connection with others. Think about how many people we're used to seeing throughout our day that we no longer do. And a collective loss of safety. So again, naming a feeling we're having really helps us manage it. We're also feeling anticipatory grief, which is the feeling we get when um, we're worried there is going to be a loss. So maybe we might have someone in, our family may have gotten a diagnosis of something, right? Anticipating that loss is also a type of grief. Grief, And so it's something we're all feeling right now, the feeling we get when what the future holds is uncertain. Um, the stages of grief. So this is something you may have heard of also, but I wanna talk about how it applies to what we're going through right now. And I know we are running short on time, so I will make this quick. Um, denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, acceptance. Okay. So um, denial. I know that when this first started happening, I was thinking, well, this isn't really going to affect us, right? Anger. What do you mean you're taking away all of my activities? Bargaining. If I just quarantine for two weeks, this will all go away. Sadness, this isn't going away. And acceptance, this is really hard, but we're going to get through it. And so anticipatory grief when it becomes unhealthy is really anxiety. So this foreboding feeling of something bad is going to happen. Um, and we worked through one tool to manage our anxiety last week, which was deep breathing. But I want to tell you about another one today, which is called the 54321 grounding exercise. So this is a mindfulness exercise that can really help us focus on the present moment. Okay, so find five things you can hear, four things you can see, three things you can touch, two things you can smell and taste. This helps us engage the five senses and bring us back into the present moment. Sometimes it can be hard to find things, smell or taste, so you can lop those off if it's hard for you. Some other ways to manage grief. So finding balance in the things that you're thinking. Um, if you are imagining the worst case scenario, try to imagine what the best case scenario is. Okay. Um, Finding balance, we all get a little sick, the world continues, right? Not everyone I love will die. Maybe no one will because we're taking the right steps. Okay, so neither scenario should be ignored, but neither should dominate either. Okay, so let yourself feel the grief and keep going. Acceptance, so we, we can find a lot of power in acceptance, a lot of control, right? I can wash my hands, I can keep a safe distance, I can learn to work from home. Um, letting go of what you can't control. So we can't control what our neighbor is doing, for example, but we can stay six feet away from them. We can wash our hands. Um, that's what's in our control. So try to focus on that. Stocking up on compassion. So again, everyone copes with 
anxiety and fear in different ways. Um, a stranger who gets snippy with you at the grocery store, right? Reminding yourself what you're seeing is their fear and anxiety. That's how they're dealing with it. So try to be patient. Remember that um, who someone really is, is different than how they may be acting in this moment. Okay. And finally, the creators of the stages of grief theory have recently added a sixth, sixth stage, which is finding meaning. This can maybe be a little hard to imagine if what you're trying to do right now is just survive. But there is meaning to be found in difficult experiences. And maybe that meaning is just for you. I'm stronger than I thought I was. I can weather more than I thought I could. I'm more resilient than I thought I was. Um, but some other types of meaning, maybe we learn to appreciate walks. Maybe we have found new ways of connecting with loved ones who are far away. Um, or maybe we learn to appreciate the things that we once took for granted, hugging a good friend or eating in a restaurant, right? The ability to send our kids to school. <laughs> okay. Um, so I hope that helps you. Um, if you are interested in mental health counseling, we are taking clients. So we see individuals, families, couples. We also run anger management groups and healthy relationship groups. So you can contact us through phone call or email. Thank you. Thank you. Those were absolutely great tips. And we are so grateful to be able to have Betsy with your calming as you talk to us and uh, help us because this is a great like break at noon and to come and to receive these tips on how to deal with these mixed emotions and actually being able to name what is going on. I, I love that piece and now facing the reality and saying it's okay and I've got to step back and name it and figure out ways to deal with it and that and knowing that our staff we're here to help. This is the resource link and we're going to put it in our chat for all the things that we've talked about uh, today and for it also will include resources that were given in the previous webinars. So if this link will have all of them compiled in it. We really appreciate you joining us today. And if you've been with us for the past um, two and that this is your third one, thank you for uh, being a part of the webinar series. We're going to start another webinar series in two weeks, and it's going to be focused on the entrepreneurship part. Look before you leap. First steps for entrepreneurship success. And we're going to be taking a look at how do you get that vision. You've got a vision, then how do you move it forward in a sustainable way? It takes a lot more than most people realize. So we're going to have some small business owners joining us, topic experts that will give us tips and resources to help get entrepreneurs started on that journey. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, first and foremost, the team here at Commonwealth Catholic Charities, we hope that you remain healthy and that you're taking all of the recommended steps to keep yourself and your family safe. We're here to help. We're here to help you, your family, your friends, or anyone that needs the services that we've talked about today that we can provide. Our team, we're just a call away, an email away, and we're here to help guide you through any of your needs that you have. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our series today and taking time to spend with us. Have a wonderful day, and we send you positive vibes. Take care. Bye-bye.